Hey, my name is Ellen Elliott, and I'm really excited to talk to you all today. Um, I'll introduce myself to you really briefly. I was a journalist in the Washington, D.C. area for 20 years before I became a writer of historical and biographical fiction for young adults mainly. Um, and one of the things that I learned as a journalist that has been really important for me as a um, fiction writer, especially with this book, Walls, is to watch for holes in coverage, um, things that haven't been written um, a lot about or or that um, my readers might not know that much about. And I had come to see that um, a lot of you teen readers didn't know a whole lot about the Berlin Wall or why NATO was formed in the first place. What we're going to do today is use this book, um, Walls, uh, as kind of a springboard to talk a little bit about the Cold War and NATO, but really also to talk about the issue of um, disinformation and propaganda. Because here's the thing, I set um, walls in the volatile year of 1960 through 1961 leading up to the walls sudden raising um, so that you had all that tension building up to it and my two characters were, were uh, my main character is an american uh, army teen who is stationed in west berlin with his military family and his cousin who is in east berlin raised up in communist dogma uh, and anti-american propaganda and they're caught up in all the he's caught up in the ardor and the camaraderie the FDJ, the um, Free German Youth at the time. The quandary in the book, one of them, is can he learn to trust a Westerner, given all this communist dogma and propaganda that he has grown up in, and vice versa, if Drew can come to trust him as well, before it's too late. Um, and it, that felt like a really powerful and poignant question to explore in this novel right now, especially in this time of really deep polarization and um, uh, divide within our own country, that disinformation and thinking in stereotypes has really kind of exacerbated. Now, I said before it's too late, because I don't want to give too much away. I hope you will really read Walls. Um, but, I, um, but I should tell you one big fact involved with this. The Berlin Wall that entrapped millions of Germans uh, for 28 years, um, that cruel barrier splitting the city in half, free versus a communist police state, literally went up overnight. 27 miles of barbed wire were unfurled between midnight, um, August 13th, 1961, until dawn. East Berliners and East Germans woke up, uh, separated, trapped, and separated from friends and families um, so unexpectedly overnight. Now, how was that possible? It's largely because of really carefully crafted and repeated disinformation. Okay, so we're going to play a game now. Um, you're probably familiar with this game, um, but I've tweaked it a little bit and kind of combined it into uh, two lies and a truth. Wait, wait, that's a lie, right? Um, for this to make sense, though, first I have to start with a map because I need you to backtrack with me just a little bit for context. Um, during the 1940s, during World War II, our alliance with Russia was critically important for the Allies to be able to defeat Hitler and the Nazis. The Russians came from the, came from the east and pushed in toward Berlin, and of course we came from the west, landing the Normandy beaches, and pushed east to meet. Um, however, as Russia, Soviet Russia, liberated those eastern European countries, they took them over. Uh, some, some were simply absorbed, Others were turned into a massive band of satellite Soviet bloc nations, and Winston Churchill of um, the British government aptly named it the Iron Curtain. Now, once Hitler was, Hitler was defeated, to restore order within Germany, um, France, England, and the United States took the western portion of Germany to reinstitute a democracy. Soviet Russia kept the eastern half and put it under communist rule. Now here's the other critical um, geography of Germany to remember, uh, particularly as we're talking about the Berlin Wall and this book. Look at the map of Germany that's going to be up on your screen. Do you see how Berlin was buried 100 miles inside the Soviet-occupied communist zone? Because Berlin was capital of um, the country originally and of Hitler's um, regime, the Third Reich, 
it was also divided among the allies to restore and rebuild. Britain, England, I'm sorry, England, um, the United States, and France, um, we took the western half of Berlin. The Soviets again retained control of the eastern half. As JFK said, Berlin was a, quote, outpost of freedom in a communist sea, a beacon of hope behind the Iron Curtain in this unbelievably tense toe-to-toe -to -toe standoff. Okay, so you've had your geography. Now, we're gonna to turn to our game, see if you can spot the truth among these three statements that I'm going to read to you. In 1961, rock and roll, Elvis Presley, and the twist drifted from West Berlin into East Germany, mainly by radio, corrupting East German youth, absolutely destroying their focus. East Germany offered them an alternative, the delightful Lipsy Dance created especially for them, but the youth, youth refused to choose it over the West's quote-unquote barbaric wiggle hip, which was the twist. Some East German twins even let their hair grow wild and got sloppy in their appearance, showing, quote, an amoral bourgeois disregard for the seriousness of learning and workers' dignity. The Berlin Wall was to protect them. In 1961, the United States and NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, was scheming to destroy East Germany's worker utopia. Those 400,000 Russian troops and tanks and artillery stationed in Germany's Soviet occupation zone, they were just there. They had to stay there to protect the good German people against Western plotting and Menschelhandel, the luring and abduction of good citizens by capitalism's fake promises. See those so-called refugees the Americans sheltered at the Marienfelder camp? They were Republikflugte, which meant disloyal traitors. They'd been seduced, like that Marlene Schmidt, who just won the Miss Universe pageant representing West Germany. She had been convinced to betray her native East Germany and, sn and snuck across the border after East Germany had nurtured her, educated her, made her an electrical engineer. She had been favored, well-employed, even given an apartment with the luxury of its own bathroom. And yet, she had been convinced by the West to prostitute herself all for a tiara. The wall, the Berlin Wall, was to protect other Germans from similar degradation. In 1961, Soviet Russia and East Germany were so worried about all the dangers facing its citizens that their political leaders came up with a plan to safeguard them. Operation Rose. They didn't want to alarm anybody, so they kept it secret. One August night, while all of Berlin's citizens, East and West, were enjoying children's festivals and fireworks, East German soldiers, paramilitary police, and factory workers quietly, so as not to disturb the festivities, unfurled and secured 27 miles of wire. The wall had to go up without warning to keep that warmongering United States and its NATO allies from stopping it, maybe even invading and to prevent East Germans brainwashed by Western American poison from panicking and abandoning their families and homeland. Okay, here's the truth. All three of those statements are propaganda, disinformation, conspiracy theories. Okay, first, let's define propaganda. Those are statements that are false or exaggerated and then repeated a lot in the same way to help a cause, a political leader, or to smear an opponent. It can be obvious and almost laughable, like some of the stuff I said to you, or it can be subtled, subtle and nuanced, which is more imperceptible and difficult to tease out. Hitler understood that propaganda was a truly terrible weapon. He wrote in Mein Kampf, the intelligence of the masses is small, but their power for getting is enormous. In consequence, all effective propaganda must be limited to a very few points repeated over and over again in slogans uh, until the last member of the public understands what you want him to, end quote. By the way, one of the slogans that Hitler uh, coined to undercut voices who were being raised up against him was Lungenpresse, which is fake news. 
What is the de best defense against all this happening? It's a free press and an engaged public um, who is informed and who weigh facts and think for themselves and then engage in debate and conversation. Let's pick apart my three statements. Um, there's a political cartoon that really beautifully captures the Cold War dynamics and situation, the kind of dire situation, um, immediately after World War II, which is you will see a Russian Soviet bear encircling all of Berlin. It's very um, representative of the situation which was Right after World War II, after this divide of Germany, um, the Soviet Russians immediately built a border, um, a barricade and uh, border patrols that East Germans called the Death Strip along the border between East Germany and West Germany. They also encircled Berlin with the same kind of barricades to keep East Germans from being able to get into Berlin easily. Because up until August 1961, Within Berlin itself, residents could cross back and forth between the sectors from free to communist, communist to free, and back. So Berlin itself um, became this hotbed of James Bond-worthy espionage. I can't believe all the things I read. I'll share some of them with you. Um, but for instance, within Berlin itself, uh, Russian KGB officers and agents, or the East German um, parallel to that, the Stasi, could easily come into Western um, Berlin and um, try to turn, turn Americans there into being moles for them and to trade in state secrets. Even to the point of some KGB uh, and Stasi kidnapping American personnel, that as of 1959, there had been 255 kidnappings and 340 attempted kidnappings of American personnel and their family by, by, um, by KGB um, or the Stasi or other agents with the East Germans. And what they were trying to do was to coerce American military on the post there. By the way, you should know that the current leader of Russia, um, Vladimir Putin, he was a KGB officer uh, as a young man, about in this time, after the wall went up, in East Germany, trying to, um, trying to recruit and uh, turn Westerners, uh, Americans and Germans, to gain NATO secrets. Now let's do some of the debunking of the propaganda I threw at you, the second statement about America supposedly scheming against um, East Germany. First, just to give you some numbers, in 1960, we had a mere 11,000 American, French, and British troops in West Berlin. They were surrounded by 400,000 Soviet troops and tank divisions, plus East Germany's army and their secret police and their paramilitary um, factory workers, and et cetera. Knowing how outnumbered our, tr our troops were within Berlin, could we, would we really plan an invasion as Russia and East Germany told their people? One of the greatest tools against falling for propaganda or conspiracy theories is logic, you guys. You're weighing seeable facts against what you're being told and thinking to yourself, does this message make sense? Now ask, if it doesn't seem logical, what would be the motivation behind coming up with such a big whopper? Or, you know, what would be the logic behind the statement that's so clearly, obviously not true when you can see for yourself the facts? Um, the motivation for Russia and East Germany giving that you know ridiculous lie that, that the Americans and, the, were, and NATO were about ready to invade Berlin is that they were furious about the fact that West Berlin had become such an escape hatch for East Germans desperate to get out. East Germans, if they could manage to get themselves into Berlin, east side of Berlin, they might be able to sneak into the western side of Berlin and seek asylum at our Marienfelder refugee camp. The East Germans certainly didn't tell the, their youth why NATO was formed in the first place. Um, because fact, 
destroys the ability to build conspiracy theories. So the reason NATO was formed um, was a Russian and East German blockade of the city of Berlin in 1948. The reason the Soviet, um, Soviet Russia and East Germany did that is because, as I told you, Berlin had become this escape hatch for all these East Germans who wanted to be able to get over to the West. And I'd mentioned before that it was largely like the educated and the, like the doctors and the lawyers and the teachers who really were in this massive wave trying to come over because of the complete lack of free speech and free thought and censorship within the communist zone. So um, remember to the geography that I told you that Berlin was buried 100 miles inside the Soviet zone. That means that everything had to come a hundred miles, if it's coming by train or coming by um, truck, it had to go through those 100 miles of Soviet Russian control territory. So this um, Russia shut that down, and it went on for almost a year. Their thought was that they could starve out Western troops, that they would evacuate being starved out, and that the West Germans would then yield to Russian rule if they were starving. It went on for almost a year. Our Air Force responded with this unbelievably bodacious airlift. For 11 months, our air crew and the Brits flew in food, fuel, children's clothes, medical supplies, whatever was needed. They landed plane, cargo planes round the clock at three minute intervals, no matter snow, no matter fog, no matter what the inclement weather. Um, about 100 um, air crew members lost their lives in doing this because of those dangers. Finally, after 11 months of this, bringing in all this, everything, all supplies, <clears throat> Russia, Soviet Russia relented and opened the border back up again for supplies to come into West uh, Berlin. Because of that, and because of their aggressive taking over of so many Eastern European countries as they moved um, to um, defeat Hitler, they just absorbed all these countries, um, America and its allies decided to uh, create an alliance which was uh, of mutual defense. Um, against Russian aggression. Okay, now let's go to talking about those refugees at Marienfelde. Remember I told you that um, the Germans were saying that they were traitorous defectors and that Marlene Schmidt, who had become Miss Universe, was actually this terrible traitor and horribly ungrateful for everything that had been done for her. So here are the facts about that. Um, again, before the wall went up, hundreds of East Germans tried every week to get into Marienfelde camp. They wanted to escape this police state oppression and censorship, terrible living conditions, food shortages, um, zealous spitzels who were neighborhood spies that could turn you in if they saw that, oh, I hear the radio playing in that neighbor's window and you were listening to you know, a Western uh, music station or reporting you if you had tuned, turned your antenna, TV antenna toward the West. Um, that's if you could afford the radio or the TV um, to begin with. Or being denied, you teenagers, from going to university if you decided to practice your religion. Or the state, maybe if you were a farmer, seizing your family farm and dividing it up into a collective. All right? So hundreds of people were trying to get out, um, mostly the educated. Um, before um, August 1961, some East Germans were actually able to get into Berlin, getting through passes for visits. Or um, those who had to sneak into the city had to do it really quickly at night. They had to move without letting their neighbors or anybody see them because they had to not only worry about the secret police or the border guards, they had to worry about their neighbors feeling like they had to turn them in or those neighbors might have been arrested as well. The final danger, as I said, was trying to slip over the border within Berlin uh, itself because there were border guards there. Um, so the refugees who did make it into Marienfelde camp typically came with absolutely nothing but the clothes on their back because if they were carrying bags or they had something from home, it was kind of a dead giveaway that they were trying to leave permanently. Um, so they were giving up everything to try to achieve freedom. Even once inside the camp um, Marienfelde that the Americans ran, um, refugees still didn't feel safe. You'll see a photograph of a man actually hiding his face as he's waiting in line to be processed because he knew that there were KGB agents and Stasi impersonating, other, impersonating refugees, trying to hide among the refugees so that they could collect information about the refugees who were trying to escape about their family, 
or their friends or their neighbors or the girlfriend that they might have had to have left behind as blackmail, as ways of threatening those people left behind, maybe even arresting them, to coerce the refugee once he was relocated by us into the West um, to become a mole to gather some sort of information um, for them. That's what happened to Marlene Schmidt. Now she's a really interesting case to talk about because she was favored in East Germany. She had planned to be there. She was happy as an engineer, this female engineer in 1960. But her mother and her sister had wanted to, to leave and had managed to escape. And the East Germans threatened Marlene with imprisonment um, as being an aid to the Republic Fluker um, of her mother and sister. In other words, they were going to punish her, potentially send her to jail for three years because she hadn't turned in her own mother and sister. And then once she had gotten out of um, that jail cell, she probably would not have had the same work that she had had before. So she decided to escape as well. Now, here's the thing. This is a really clear indication of, um, of turning some elements of truth, spinning it into making it propaganda. Okay, now to us, knowing all the facts that I just shared with you, people actually believing that kind of propaganda seems ludicrous. But as George Orwell, I hope all of you guys have read 1984 or Animal Farm, he said, quote, if all records told the same tale, then lie becomes truth. So East Germany and its overlord, Russia, fed Germans the same lies the same slogans over and over again from the time that um, East Germans were very, very young. They were brought up to view Westerners and Americans with fear and distrust. Even their fellow countrymen or even relatives and friends who might live just over the border in West Berlin or West Germany, they were seen as being um, captives of capitalism, which was bad. And they were looked at with suspicion and derision. And here's how they started. Again, you're probably thinking, how would people think this? Well, they started when they were really young. The first thing that they did to make sure that um, they, they followed the philosophy that, um, that a lot of totalitarian and authoritarian states do, Hitler and Stalin certainly did, that youth are the best material, the best human material for making a society the way that they want it to be. That started in East Germany with um, strict discipline, standardized possessions and opportunities, everybody getting the same chances, um, but also unquestioning faith uh, in in the authority of the Communist Party. Started with toddlers being potty trained to go all at the same time. It then went on into their, you'll, uh, children would be playing in rubble that had been left in East Berlin um, from World War II bombing, maybe to remind people about the American bombers. But there would be these enormous posters, for instance, that were like two stories high that would show the Russian bear pushing away a NATO soldier who's got missiles under his arm. So he's this threatening, warmongering threat to the East Germans and their best friend, the Russians, are protecting them from it. There is a slogan running, there would be slogans running across buildings, um, one that was on top of the FDJ headquarters that read, Berlin Youth, fight for peace and the victory of socialism. To attend university as a teenager, the, you had to join the FDJ, the Free German Youth. You had to participate in the Jugendwe, which was a youth consecration, sort of like confirmation classes. Um, and confirmation is for those of you who might go through that with your church. Um, they did that at age 14, and they had to sign a loyalty oath as well as going to paramilitary summer camps to be ready at any moment to defend the fatherland um, themselves. I'm going to read you this oath that Matthias signs. Um, that was the oath that East Germans had to take. Because of the threat of war, the imperialism and politics of NATO, it is a moral consequence that I, as a young socialist, help to defend the working class even to the extent of pledging my life. At any time deemed necessary by the party, I will bear arms and defend peace, my fatherland, and the workers and peasants' government. I will familiarize myself with the use of arms, um, with revolutionary discipline, and unconditional obedience. 
Okay, you'd have to assign that at 14. The party also used peer pressure the, um, to prove as a teenager that you were a really ardent member of the party. You would be encouraged to turn in any classmate or friend who you felt was not enthusiastic enough um, during a lecture or during a parade or during some other gatherer. Or, um, or if you didn't shout friendship uh, in greeting the way that they were told to with enough, enough pizzazz, right? Or if you didn't turn them into um, school authorities, you could also pull them in front of your own peer tribunals, which is what happens to my uh, character, Matthias. Um, he's pulled in for, because I read about it in a memoir and it just kind of broke my heart, he's pulled in to give self-criticism, which was um, Sib's critique. Self-criticism and repenting. He was supposed to, you know, say why he's so sorry he didn't he didn't mean to not be enthusiastic enough or whatever it else that they were going to accuse him of in this memoir in 12 live i'm sorry 12 years one of the things that the author had been accused of and told was that because of having acne it did not show the cleanliness expected of fdj members and he bit on his fingernails which indicated that he was sly and unworthy you know i i can't imagine what it would be like to have to worry about classmates who might turn you in if you don't wave a flag enthusiastically enough at a parade. But that's the way it was. Okay, we're gonna go back now to talk about my first statement about rock and roll corrupting German youth. Um, we've talked a little bit about all the dangers involved for kids wanting to hear um, music. Up until then, also August 1961, teenagers like my East German cousin Matthias could come into the West for the day to visit which meant that he could experience American music and maybe try to smuggle a, uh, an American record at 45, they were called at that point, they were small, um, put it in his pocket and try to take it back over to his communist home so that he could hear Elvis, so that he could hear the twist, you know, this wonderful music that his cousin was enjoying, but was taboo for him. Just, you should know, that um, if a teenager like Matthias had actually been caught on the eastern side of Berlin with that American pop music record in his pocket somehow, he could have been arrested and charged with culture barbare, which means culture corruption, which in East Germany at that time was akin to sedition because it's, quote, bringing in the West's evil virus of decadence. That teenager, that like Matthias, could have been sent to a re-education camp, all for listening to American music and bringing it into the, the workers' utopia. Um, why were the Russian and the East Germans so afraid of that? Because everything about that music, that music that you guys love and still know from the Beatles, and they were just starting at that time, is that it's, it's celebrating free speech and feeling you know, youthful exuberance and individuality. Individuality, thinking for yourself, those are all anathema to any police state that is reliant on citizen conformity and that uses propaganda, disinformation, or conspiracy theories to get you to stay put, right? Or to believe what they're trying to tell you. Now, just for, for instance, um, they told East German youth the twist, which is a really mild dance, you guys, look it up and watch it. It's really great fun. But that it was dangerous, it was decadent, it was debasing to East Germans. Um, they even had the state-run youth magazine say this about Elvis, quote, his music resembled his face, stupid and brutal, um, roaring like a stung deer, but not so melodic. Their way of countering that was to come up with this thing called the Lipsy Dance, which was this weird kind of dance combining the waltz, the rumba, um, a little bit of the cha-cha. It was supposed to counter American, quote, trash, petty bourgeois, hot music, and free dancing, which meant, in their minds, individual contortions, all right? Um, bombarded with all this disinformation about their lives, many kind of just accepted the statement that the West was dangerous, that the Berlin Wall was for its own good. Okay. Now here's to my final truthy lie statement, which has to do with the wall, the night, the night the wall went up. It did go up overnight, which is hard to believe, I know. 
It had been planned so cunningly and carefully by the East Germans and Soviet Russia. They had been stockpiling barbed wire, 330 tons of it, for months, even protective gloves and pre-made concrete posts. They managed to keep it all quiet and in warehouses. They timed putting the wall up for a night, um, a holiday weekend in August, um, when there were two festivals going on. One was a Volksfest that the American teens on the Army base were hosting for celebrating friendship with Germans, and an annual Kinderfest that was hosted in a borough, and its slogan was, we are all one, it was hosted in a borough um, where the line, the demarcation line between the Russian sector and the American sector literally ran right down the middle of the main street. And it was supposed to celebrate all children, um, all German people um, together. They knew that they were, everybody was going to be at these wonderful festivals, enjoying one another, feeling really good about unity. They not, weren't going to have their guards up. There were going to be fireworks going on so that people wouldn't notice or wouldn't hear the military vehicles that were beginning to collect around the um, edge of the city. Um, at midnight, a few minutes past midnight, they mobilized 38,000 East German soldiers, transportation and border guards, factory militia, and the people's police. They began unfurling all those 27 miles worth of coiled wire. At 1 a.m., they doused all street lamps. At 1.30, they shut down all trains, dug up the tracks to create these barricades, and sealed sewer manholes so you couldn't get out through the sewer. At 2 a.m., Russian troops and tanks surrounded the city with orders to crush any uprising. By dawn, as the sun rose, Berliners awoke to militiamen already digging up cobblestones, getting ready to plant these concrete posts to secure the wire to. There was this truck rolling around broadcasting saying that this is being done for your own good. From the warmongers in the West who scheme against, against us, East Berliners will no longer be subjected to the degradation and the deterioration of capitalism. Rejoice, remain calm, soon red flags will flutter across all of Germany. So here's what you need to remember about propaganda. It's not always outright lies, all right? Sometimes it's about spin, which requires even more careful analysis from us about what the motivation of the statement is and what are the facts, what we can actually see for ourselves, right? People began to gather on both sides, watching with huge anxiety, shouting at loved ones to come across while they still could. Youth even stood down youth. Many Germans, East Germans, who had been inculcated with all this propaganda and all this disinformation, convinced themselves that the berries, oh, they would be temporary, or they are, in fact, for our own good. Others, however, realized that they just had a mere matter of hours before the barrier would be completely sealed to try to escape. They came out windows, took whatever they could. You will see a photograph of a grandma being lowered out of a building, um, windows in a building that was adjacent, flushed to the free zone, the American sectors. And you have the um, West Berlin police down there holding a tarp to try to catch her. And if you look at the other photograph, um, you'll see that there's a child being dropped three stories out of a window to get to freedom. Very quickly after that day, um, they, they add cinder block and searchlights and watchtowers in this deadly no man zone um, with landmines so that nobody can really go it, get across it. If you rushed the wall as that was going on, you would be shot. Um, and one of the first to perish was an 18-year-old boy named Peter Fechter, who managed to get over the wall, run across the um, dead man zone, and be shot. And they left him to bleed to death in that strip. Um, the West Berliners were crying out for the East Berlin um, police, the East Germans, to help him, but they didn't, and the boy died. Um, there would be more tragic deaths following after that, more extraordinary escape attempts with hot air balloons, tunnels, um, M many uh, inventive and incredibly brave attempts to get out, but it would be 28 years before the Berlin Wall was actually taken down by citizens themselves in 1989. Now, the Berlin Wall is a really stark example of what disinformation, propaganda, conspiracy theories can do to build up an authoritarian government um, and entrap its citizens and kill free speech of any kind. But it's not as if less dire propaganda, disinformation, and conspiracy theories aren't used in other countries, including democracies, and sometimes in our own. We have had moments where politicians have used hate labels, hate um, slogans, um, 
uh, propaganda and disinformation to try to convince you to think a certain way, um, to increase their own power and to discredit their opponents. Um, one of the darkest hours uh, that for us as a nation was something that's called McCarthyism um, time period, which was in the 1950s, when um, a true legitimate fear of communism was turned into kind of this hysteria and mob fear within the United States by the language that this particular politician and his compatriots used to gin up fear. McCarthy, he exploited fears and divisions that already existed within our country um, about the Cold War communist threats that were real out there globally um, to create this kind of paranoia and hysteria and polarization within our country, um, Americans against Americans, um, mainly to try to crush political leanings or opposition that he didn't like. Now, how did he do that? By using unsubstanti unsubstantiated accusations or innuendo presented as fact. He painted citizens who pushed for change um, or who might be involved in the civil rights movement or in, in improving labor laws as being subversives and un-American. He used conspiracy theories. He used exaggeration, hyperbole, and inflated numbers to accuse and discredit political enemies and the press. He tapped into xenophobia. He used demeaning, catchy, character assassination labels like pinkos, dupes, long hairs, Ivy League eggheads, and the not so veiled threat of better dead than red. I actually wrote a book called Suspect Red that I hope you'll look into too that's all about this whole era and goes into it in far more detail than I can right now because you guys have been listening to me for a while now. Um, but I do want to kind of draw the parallel between um, more subtle kinds of propaganda, disinformation, and conspiracy theory and how dangerous it is. Spurred on by McCarthy's statements and this kind of fear that started permeating the country, um, local politicians and local groups, library groups, community organizations started kind of their own red hunt as well. They could pull in people to their loyalty review boards. Um, and the people who are most in the crosshairs of all this were librarians and teachers. These people could be called in and get in trouble because of their choice of friends um, or their reading material or they had signed petitions or they supported civil rights or they thought that labor laws should be changed to the benefit of the worker um, or simply pushing back on the lies that McCarthy and his cronies were promoting. They could be pulled in, they could be discredited and tagged as being disloyal or un-American. Um, there was this unofficial um, blacklist that went around. A lot of you guys may know about the Hollywood 10. Not enough time to talk about it right now. But that spilled over into all sorts of other people involved, either in education or in um, the arts. It got so bad that things like Robin Hood were banned. Robin Hood was banned at the recommendation of an Indiana textbook commissioner because she said um, he took from the rich, he gave to the poor, that's a communist philosophy. Um, it's trying to convince kids it's a smearing of law and order. Librarians across the country to keep their jobs might have to pull Robin Hood off the shelves. Now, sometimes standing up against um, these kinds of things, I'm sorry, sometimes it seems to fall to the youth who can see right straight through this kind of nonsense, which is what happened with Robin Hood. These five co-eds at Indiana University thought they had had enough with that, that we were banning Robin Hood. That's how silly it had gotten in their mind. They went to nearby farms, got burlap bags full of um, feathers, brought them back to the dorm room and dyed them green and began handing those feathers out, I have some here, as just kind of this wonderful, peaceful, symbolic statement of do you think that the censorship is really right? Their protests, they were, they were condemned by the local press. They were called long hair radicals. And actually, they were fairly conservative kids who, had been, uh, who were involved in a um, church group, um, which is when they raised this issue about Robin Hood. Um, anyway, they, th it spawned this green feather movement across college campuses, Stanford, um, I think it was Harvard, UCLA. And those five co-eds 
um, are, are credited by some historians as starting the um, campus uh, protests uh, and movement that became really important in helping the civil rights movement and the anti-Vietnam War movement. Anyway, I love to share green feathers with you all because here's what I hope you guys will do. Um, think for yourselves. You're smart. You tell your parents all the time that you can think for yourselves. Please do it. There are going to be a lot of things that are going to be disinformation, propaganda, conspiracy theories. Please think through them. And remember that in our country was founded on the idea, this kind of radical, revolutionary idea, that we could think for ourselves. We didn't have to be told what to do or what to think by a king or by the church or by a parliament. We had this innate, amazing ability to think for ourselves. But it does require that we do that, that we have a free press and that we consume a lot of different facts and then with our own bright minds, think through what it is that we really believe. Whatever spectrum of um, the political line um, that you guys are on, believe in what you believe because you have thought about it. And just as we're having our conversations, remember the glorious thing about democracy is that it is based on e pluribus unum, which means for many, one. Thank you so much for listening.